All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and we've got a whole bunch of kids joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. If you haven't checked out our site at exploringbytheseat.com, we've got tons of programs coming up to wrap up October, and then all through November, amazing sessions on all topics, but October is focused on space. We've got NASA engineers, we've got astronauts, we've got CSA personnel. It is a fantastic month highlighting our efforts to explore the cosmos around us. So, huge welcome to our four classes live right now. We should be getting a few more over the next few minutes and all our students joining on YouTube and Facebook. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, let me know where you're joining from. I'd love to find out uh, where you guys are coming in from and share your questions with Kevin. So today, we are joined by one of my favorite people to have on the broadcast, Kevin DeBruin. So, for all of you who wake up and you're like lazy, you don't feel like doing anything today, Kevin is the antidote to all that because he just cannot stop himself from doing all sorts of cool things. He is a former NASA rocket scientist. He's a spacecraft systems engineer. He's gotten to work on some of the most elite and amazing robot space missions of all time. He's an Eagle Scout, American Ninja Warrior, personal fitness trainer. He does it all. Without further ado, I'm gonna bring in Kevin. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us again, man. And uh, can't wait to hear from you again today. This is great. Uh, thanks, Jesse. That was an amazing intro there. I am like extremely grateful for, for you doing that. That was amazing. My pleasure, man. Well, hey, you live it, and I'm excited to hear your story and share with all sorts of kids today. Get some great questions from kids around the globe. So let's dive in, man. All right, fantastic. So I got about like 20 minutes of where I'm going to like teach you guys, talk to you about like what I did at NASA, one mission specifically that's really exciting for me. And then we're going to open up to questions. Because I want to answer all of your curious minds about what you might be thinking about space or if you got questions about American Ninja Warrior or anything else that you hear as we're going through here. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see some cool pictures and videos that I put together over here. So we'll go with that, make it nice and big so we can all see it. Give me the thumbs up, Jesse, when I'm good to go. Almost, so it didn't want to, it didn't work for some strange reason. It worked earlier. We got oh, your slide yeah. deck on the left still, which is cool. It's kind of like a sneak peek, but there's a way to make that thing full screen. Oh, mm. geez, let's check that All out. Right. Try full screen. If you did application window before, try full screen. Sometimes that works. Do the entire screen. We'll share that, which means you're seeing a couple different things. Yeah, very meta. There we go. Perfect. So you're good to go, man. Awesome. Can you can see my cursor as well. It's in the sky. Yeah, we're perfect. Go for yeah. it. Okay. Well, what's up, everybody? So, like uh, Jesse said, Kevin J. DeBruin. So, what we're looking at here is NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is in Pasadena, California, just outside of Los Angeles, where I used to work and where I'm still currently living. And I like to point this out because these are the buildings that the Mars rovers and all, almost all of the spacecrafts that are out beyond the moon are designed and built in before we send them off to the launch pad to go into outer space on the top of a rocket. And if you see this building right here that I'm moving around with my cursor, it's kind of like a teal green. That's where I used to work. That is that window right there. That's not my office. I was in the center. I wasn't one of the big fancy people on the sides. But that is where all of the rocket scientists and other types of scientists would come together and we would design these rovers, these spacecrafts, these satellites that you're seeing out on other planets and orbiting around other planets, flying to the outsides of our solar system. Now, first off, let's talk a little bit about who I am. All right, so I'm Kevin. I'm literally a rocket scientist, and that is my favorite thing that I get to say. I know how to design spaceships. Now, my official title, which you put on your job application and resume stuff, is systems engineer, and that was at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we just call that JPL. I'm also, as Jesse said, an American Ninja Warrior. I competed on season nine and season 10, and we're on season 12 right now. So for the last two seasons, I'm not competing. I'm actually working with American Ninja Warrior, the company, to test the new obstacles that they have. So you know when you're watching the show and then there's a new obstacle? Well, I've played on that to make sure it's not too easy for the ninjas, not too hard. Maybe things are a little higher or lower. Maybe we want to make it spin more. So I help them make that look all fun and fancy. And lastly, I'm an Eagle Scout. I like to talk about that because it talks about community service, you know, helping back helping give back to the community, and it teaches you a lot of really cool things. So if you're in the scouts or not in a service 
organization, I suggest you join one. It really helps you out when you're going for college scholarships, college applications, and then actually getting a job. I've got some of my jobs because I was an Eagle Scout. They looked down at the resume and were like, you're an Eagle Scout. We know we can trust you because you know how to communicate, you're a leader, and you know how to operate with the team. So I just got some cool pictures of me down here. The one on the bottom left side we see is with the Mars rover, the Curiosity rover. This isn't the actual one, but it's the same size. That's how big it is on the surface of Mars. Then you got me there with an astronaut glove pointing at you, kind of like Iron Man, with a special moon in the background that we're going to talk about today. And then lastly, that's just my car on the right-hand side with the license plate rocket side, because I just love everything about rocket science. Now, why I became a rocket scientist is because of this. I like to share my motivation. It's a movie, it's called October Sky, you see it on the left-hand side, and it's based upon this book, so it's a true story called Rocket Boys, and that guy you see on the right is Homer Hickam. He started off, if you haven't seen the movie, seeing the first satellite ever go across the night sky, and got inspired, starting building rockets with his friends, that photo on the left-hand side, they win a science fair. He goes on to become a NASA engineer training astronauts. Now, I saw this when I was 10 years old, and was like, wow. I want to design spaceships for NASA. And I like to talk about this because it's hard work. Going through school, having tests, doing homework, all of these projects, I went up to the 19th grade. And there was a lot of times where I got sad or it was difficult and I kind of wanted to give up. I would re-watch this movie or reread this book to help reignite that fire, that inspiration. So it's something that can help you when you're kind of feeling down in the dumps or you're getting stressed out or maybe tired. You're like, why do I have to do this math homework? It was like, oh yeah, the math homework helps me design the spaceships eventually. It's just part of the journey. So I like to share that with you. And there we go. <laughs> this is what I used to look like as I was sitting in your seats. It wasn't that long ago where I saw October Sky and was figuring out exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And that was working for NASA designing spaceships. You know, and then as I grew up going into high school, here's my education. Like I got a high school degree, then I got a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from University of wisconsin Platteville, and then I went on to Georgia Tech, and I have a master's in aerospace engineering, and that's where I went to the 19th grade. So it's a long journey, but it's worth it, because then you can design spaceships. So speaking of spaceships, that's the important part, right? That's what we want to get to here, is we want to talk about space. So we got here, we got eight planets, not nine. Pluto is demoted, and we can talk about that later if you want. But let's bring this up because this is what I want to talk about, that cool moon we saw earlier. Here's our planets. So that moon was called Europa. And if you haven't heard of Europa before, I'm very excited to tell you all about it. And if you have heard about it, you're going to learn even more. So we got our eight planets here. Now, some of them have moons, some don't. Mercury and Venus do not have moons, but everyone else in the solar system does. Saturn has the most, but Jupiter has a whole lot too. So let's bring up Jupiter. The four biggest moons are called the Galilean moons, and they're right here. So going from closest to furthest away, we got Io. It is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. What that means is there's volcanoes erupting all the time. So you see some of those little dots on the moon? Those are volcanoes. Next up is Europa. We're going to dive into that one in a second. So we're going to jump on to Ganymede. This is the largest moon in the solar system. It is bigger than the planet Mercury. Yeah, bigger than Mercury. So if it wasn't around Jupiter, it probably could have been its own planet. And then Callisto, that last one there. That is one of the oldest, if not the oldest body in our solar system. Right, Kevin, how do you know that? Well, take a look. You see all those bright dots? Those are actually craters. So the longer something has been in our solar system, the more chance it has of things hitting it. So the impact crater creates those little holes all around. So if you look at a body, a body being like a moon, a comet, an asteroid, a planet, a star, and it has a ton of craters on it, we call it crater dating, and it's got so many craters on it, we know that it's been so old. Now they are actually a lot further apart than they are here in this image. This is just to show them really close. So we found these over 400 years ago. A guy named Galileo, you might have heard of him, looked through his telescope, and found these four moons. Now Europa, that's the cool one. That's the one that I worked on. And it looks cool, literally, like it's blue. Blue's cool color. We got these red splotches and some red lines. Maybe those are cracks. 
maybe an alien was just taking a shovel and you know made those cracks. We don't know. Well, we kind of do. So Europa is the best place in our solar system to find aliens. Yes, if there's aliens in our solar system, we believe that Europa is the best place to search for them. Now, why? Well, Europa has the ingredients for life that we know about. Because there's life like we know, like us, we're carbon-based life forms and stuff. And then there's life that we don't know about. But this is what we do know. There you need three things to find life. Like when we find life here on Earth, it has these three things. So the first one there is water. Where you find water here on Earth, you find life. You go out, well, I'm close to the ocean, so I can take a spoon, go a couple miles down the road, take a spoonful of ocean water, and there are millions of microorganisms just inside that one spoonful of water. So Europa is essentially a big ball of water that's frozen on the outside. It's got this huge liquid ocean underneath it, and then it's got an icy crust on the top. So we can check that box. Europa has water. Now, what else do you need? You need chemistry. So that's in the bottom left-hand corner there. You need the building blocks of life. You know, the things that we find in rocks. Specifically, you may have heard these words before, and if not, they're cool science words. You need carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. C-H-N-O-P-S is the abbreviation. I say schnapps, and that's how I remember it. So you need those elements. Those are scientific elements on the periodic table in the right combinations to build up life. And we think that Europa has all of them out there. We've actually detected some of them already from previous missions and from using the Hubble Space Telescope. That's a giant telescope that's out orbiting Earth, looking out at distant planets and stars and other galaxies. Okay, so now energy. We need a way to power life, right? So here on Earth, what do, what do we have? What's that huge thing in the sky during the daytime that gives us all our heat and light? The sun. Well, Jupiter, which is where Europa is, is five times further away than Earth is from the sun. So the sun is just not strong enough to power life like how we do here on Earth, how it does here on Earth. So we need something else to happen. Well, we saw those four moons before, right? That go around Jupiter called the Galilean moons. Well, they actually, they play with each other the whole time. They push on each other and pull on each other. So make a fist and hold it really tight. So this is Europa when it's not being played with. And then open it up a little bit and then squeeze it. Open it up a little bit and squeeze it. So that's what's going on at Europa. It expands a little bit and stretches and then compresses. And that's because the other moons are pushing and pulling on it with their gravity. Now, how does that give us energy? Well, put your hands together, all right? And now rub them real fast. What do you feel? You feel heat, right? Well, there's friction. So that movement of moving your hands together creates friction, creating heat. And that is what the energy source is out at Europa to maintain that liquid, right? If we have liquid water way out in space, how does it stay liquid without some sort of energy, some sort of warmth? That's it. It's Europa getting bigger and smaller. And what's really interesting is that image in the bottom right. So that's from the surface, not the surface, the ocean floor at Earth. And those are hydrothermal vents or things like underwater volcanoes that are releasing salts and minerals and energy into the ocean. And we have those here on Earth. Yeah. And we find life around those, what we call also like black smokers. You see like the black smoke that's coming out of it. We got hairy snails. We have fish you can see through down there. It's crazy. It's completely black. No sunlight can get there. But all of the energy coming out of these vents powers the life down there. And so energy from the sun is called photosynthesis. That's how our plants get their metabolism, their energy, their life source. Down there, it's chemical energy called chemosynthesis. So we believe the combination of water, the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and this chemosynthesis is going on at Europa, and that is the best place in our solar system to find aliens. Now, I know what you're thinking, are there gonna be like alien sharks and alien whales and maybe alien octopus out there? I would love to find that, but I don't think we will. What we're looking for are tiny little microorganisms, so small you can't see them with your eye, you'll need a microscope to look at them. So we're gonna see if we can find them. And how are we gonna do that? 
Well, we jump past that really quick. I want to show you this first. So this is Europa Clipper. This is the spacecraft that we're currently building to send out to Europa to investigate and see if we can find these potential signs of life. What we're really testing for is how habitable, habitable, it's a big word. Well, habitat is like something you can live in. Habitable is, is that place livable? So we're gonna test and see if everything we think about Europa being livable is accurate. We're gonna do that with Europa Clipper. Now I started working on this spacecraft when I was in college, and then once I got hired at NASA, I kept working on this spacecraft and another one that I'll tell you about after this. So what does it look like there? It's kind of funky looking. Well, the big circle in the middle, that's our antenna. Essentially, it's like a cell phone that we call home with. So we point that at Earth and we send all of our information back. Like, hey, we found carbon. Hey, we found CO2. Hey, we found H2O. We found all these things. Or if things go wrong with the spacecraft, that's how it can tell us, hey, something's going wrong. And we can be like, hold on. Okay, do this to fix yourself. And the big little panel things you see on the side, like the wings, those are solar panels. So the sun can't power life, but gigantic solar panels can absorb some of the sun's energy to power our spacecraft out there. And then the rest of the things you see on there are other types of science instruments, like microscopes and radars and other things for us to test as we're going around Europa. So what does it look like? And when are we going to launch? So we're going to launch in approximately 2023. So about three years from now, we've started to build this thing already. It's being built in a couple different places around the country, and they're all gonna come together to create our spacecraft. We'll launch it in three years. And then it looks like this. So on the left-hand side is tracing the path of the spacecraft once it gets to Jupiter. Now it's gonna take a long time to get to Jupiter, about two and a half years. And then once we're here, we're gonna be at Jupiter for two and a half years, and we're actually orbiting Jupiter and just flying by Europa because the radiation environment at Jupiter is crazy. Let me play that again for you while we're talking. So we're seeing our spacecraft go on the left-hand side. It's doing long looping orbits around Jupiter and then closely flying by Europa to hustle in and collect our science. On the right-hand side, you see all the different places, those white lines, where we're flying over Europa to essentially be like we're orbiting it. But like I said, we're not orbiting it, we're flying by it because of the radiation environment at Jupiter. Jupiter is so big, it pulls in a lot of the radiation with gravity and electronics don't like gravity. Like if you've accidentally ever put metal in the microwave and it goes crazy, don't do that. Jupiter is like a huge microwave out there and we don't want our spacecraft, which is metal with electronics to be in there very long. Now, what does each one of those look like? Well, as we're going into Europa, each of those things is called a flyby. And it looks like this. We're coming in, these different colored bars turning on are just different science instruments. So as you get closer, this blue and pink is us taking photos back and forth, back and forth to give us a stereo image. So like a two direction image of what we're looking at the surface. And then we keep on flying by. And then when we get so far away that our instruments, our science devices don't really work anymore, we turn them off. And then we take all of that data, all of that information that we've collected and send it back to Earth with that giant antenna. Let's look at that again. So we're like 66,000 kilometers away. We've got our radars on. We're coming in and trying to see how thick is that ice? How deep is the ocean? Let's take some high resolution pictures to see what the surface is like if we wanna land there in the future. And let's keep on studying it until we get again about 66,000 kilometers away, trying to detect the, the gravity, field around Europa, what it's like, what's the radiation like, and then send all of that information back to Earth. Now it's gonna take 14 days before we come back and fly by again. We're gonna be sending information to Earth and then recharging our solar panels. So it takes, we're coming in, we come within 10 kilometers here, flying super, super fast, a couple kilometers a second as we're flying through. And then we have to get out of there because we're in the hard radiation zone and then kind of like cool off recharge ourselves, and then in two weeks, we're gonna come by and do that again for two and a half years. So we're collecting all this information to see, is Europa actually livable? The word we use is habitable. And if so, we should probably send something to the surface, maybe something like a rover, a lander of sorts, to actually test for the signs of life. 
So Europa Clipper won't be able to find aliens. It's not designed to do that. But we did work on this. This is Europa Lander, the other spacecraft that I helped build. Well, not build, design. So this one isn't official. It's not going to be launched yet. But NASA was like, okay, if we want to put something on the surface of Europa and see if we can test like the ice, maybe get down to the ocean a little bit, how are we going to do that? So we designed this. It's a box. It's a big metal box to protect us from the radiation with all of our important electronics inside. That thing that looks like a face is our antenna. That's our way to communicate home with those two little eyes being cameras to take pictures. Then we got the robotic arm out there with a saw and a shovel on the end of it to saw it into the ice and scoop up some and then put it in a little container that's right on the front there in the belly where all the microscopes and stuff are. Now it's not officially going to happen, we really want to, but first Europa Clipper is gonna go out and investigate. And then if it finds some really cool stuff, then NASA is probably gonna be like, here's money, go build Europa Lander and send it off to Europa to find it. Now, I really wanna to quickly touch on how I got into NASA, because if you're out there and you're like, I wanna work for NASA, how do I do it? Well, I wrote a book on it. It's called To NASA and Beyond. It's on Amazon and Audible. This tells you my whole story, but I'm gonna tell you a short version right now. So I took a lot of advanced classes as early as I could, because I'm like, I need to get smart, <laughs> smarter, I need to work hard. So I took summer school math classes, and then I took anything that was like, building or design or engineering, like machine shop, wood shop, drafting, computer programming, trying to get all those technical skills as possible. And then seeing if I could take any college courses in high school. I tried, took a few of them. Then getting into college was a little bit difficult for me. I got into undergrad, but then I needed to get into grad school. So I like to share this story because my journey into NASA was really tough. I failed a lot, but I never gave up. It took me three years and over 150 internship applications before I actually got my first internship. Then I applied to Georgia Tech for grad school. They said no, but then they said yes a couple of weeks later after I was talking to them. And then NASA JPL, I applied to them, went through three rounds of interviews, and they said no. So that leads me to graduating without a job but I was able to get a 10 week temporary internship with NASA to prove to them that I belong. And the last day of that internship, I got hired as a full-time NASA rocket scientist. Now, not everyone has this hard of a time getting into NASA, getting into internships or grad school, but I share it to show it's not impossible, right? Everyone kept telling me no, but if you truly believe in yourself and you're willing to sacrifice and work for it, you can make it happen. Because NASA wants you. There are so many different positions that we can fill. I'm an engineer and scientist. There are about 80% of us at NASA are engineers and scientists. But we also have managers. We have accountants. We have lawyers. We have artists. So if you're not really feeling the technical side, like math isn't your passion or science, math was not my passion. I had to take a couple classes a few times. Same with science, but I actually wanted to design the spacecraft, so I kept going. But if you want to do something else, if you're really passionate about art or design, uh, management, being a lawyer, maybe an attorney, maybe you're really good with numbers, you can find a position within NASA to do that. So we, we, we take it all. We, we want you to help join us to lead the next generation of explorers to go out and actually put those boots on Mars, because it actually might be one of you that are going to be the first astronauts that are walking around on Mars. It's possible. Now, lastly, I'm gonna tell you that I teach about space. So it says former NASA rocket scientist, right? I left NASA to teach people about space. And one place that I do that is on YouTube, where we're at right now. And youtube.com slash a place called space is where I create a lot of my videos for kids like you who wanna learn about space. And lastly, I do a lot of stuff on Instagram as well, at Kevin J. DeBruin right there is where you can find me on Instagram. And if I'm not able to answer your questions today, if we run out of time, send me a message on Instagram and I answer all of them because I don't want anyone to not get their question answered when they're interested about space. So thank you, everybody. Now I want to open it up for questions to see if you have some questions about space, science, American engineer, anything of this sort. 
All of it. Well, that is awesome. First of all, thank you so much for such an amazing presentation as always. And the first known use of alien whales in one of our broadcasts. Never been said before. So kids, you're lucky. Uh, we had a whole bunch more classes join us while you were chatting there. So Pennsylvania, we got Niagara Falls, we've got Creston, Ohio, um, at least four more classes on YouTube. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of kids from around North America taking part today. Thank you so much for tuning in. So let's dive in. Um, I want to start with Ms. DeBry's class. They are joining us in Ontario. So welcome in Ms. DeBry's group. Do you want to share a question with us? Kick us off. Let's do this thing. Hello, we have a few questions, so we don't want to take up everyone's time, but um, we have a few questions about the spacecraft. So uh, how fast does it travel when it goes from Earth to Europa? Um, will the, uh, the clipper come back uh, after it's done its mission? Will it come back to Earth? And okay. if you need the Europa lander, will you prepare it in case it needs to be sent, or is that just testing right now? All right, great question. So the first one is, how fast will the spacecraft go? Well, to get off of the surface of Earth, we have to be going at least 17,500 miles an hour. But that only gets you off the surface of Earth. If you want to leave Earth's orbit, go to the moon, go to Mars, go to beyond, you have to go at least 25,000 miles per hour. So we'll be going at least that fast. Now, Europa Clipper is supposed to go aboard the SLS. That's the Space Launch System, the new rocket that NASA is designing. And we're going to put that thing in like Ferrari mode and shoot straight to Jupiter instead of doing flybys, which you may have heard of before, where we have to build up speed by flying back around Earth and stealing some gravity and going out there. So we're still waiting to see exactly what the SLS can do once it's fully done. Well, it will be going at least 25,000 miles an hour. Now, the second one what was that second question was... Um, oh, shoot. What was it? Is there is there <laughs> life on Europa? I don't know if that was it. Um, so oh, will it come back to will it come back to will Earth? Come back to Earth? Earth? Will it come back to Earth? No, it will not. Because to come back to Earth, we need to add more fuel so it can leave the Jupiter system and come all the way back to Earth. And it's not worth it for us. So what we're actually probably going to do is crash it into Jupiter is most likely what's going to happen. We've done that with other spacecrafts in the past where we crash them into planets to make sure that they don't accidentally crash into a moon that has life. And then we accidentally put earth bugs all over that place. And we might find bugs and then go, hey, but these are earth bugs or are they Europa bugs? We don't know. So we're not gonna bring the Europa Clipper back. And lastly, about the lander. Will we prepare it just in case? Well, NASA asked us to look at a couple different things. They asked us if we wanna launch Clipper and lander together, what is that going to look like and how much is it going to cost? And through all of the trade space, we did many different design studies. The best thing to do was to launch Europa Lander later. Now, if NASA does want to give us the money to build it, we will do that right now and uh, launch it a few years after Clipper. That was our game plan. That's what it's set up to do if NASA decides to go, yes, do it. We're going to give you the money, build it, design it, finish it up, send it out there. But right now, it's just kind of, put it in a box, we put a bow on it, put it on the shelf, and if NASA tells us to dust it off, we'll dust it off, refresh it, and then build it and send it out there. A great awesome. question. It is a great question to kick us off. We're gonna to go to all our teachers in succession. And by the way, Kevin, you end your presentation with something I love when we talk about space, is that if you're keen on space, there are so many avenues to get involved in NASA and Canadian Space Agency, whatever you're keen on. Uh, but no matter what you're doing, kids, if you find something you're as passionate about as Kevin is about space, do that because if you can be this keen, it's a it's a, a great career, and I'm sure Kevin would tell you that uh, every single day. Um, Miss Hamilton joining us for the first time ever in Toronto, Ontario. So welcome in, Miss Hamilton. If you want to share a question with us, go for it. Okay, so one of my students wanted to know what happens to a failed spaceship. I've got like three questions, but that's like the first one. Yeah, what happens to a failed spaceship? Uh, I'm going to take that a couple different ways. So sometimes our rockets fail when we launch them, and that means, unfortunately, the spacecraft blows up. And luckily, sometimes we have we build two just in case, or we build one to keep on Earth so we can test. Then we turn that one into the real one and launch it. Sometimes it just goes away, and then we have to build it all over from scratch if they give us the money to do that. The other way is, like, let's say it's a failed spacecraft in outer space. We've had that happen where things don't always work right. And we can communicate with the spacecraft with an antenna so we can send them information. 
They can send us information, figure out maybe what's going wrong. We do the best we can to create software patches. So do the computer code, send it up there to try and get the spacecraft back working and try to like limp it along, kind of like give the spacecraft crutches to see if it can continue to do some of the mission. And that happened with the Galileo spacecraft, which is the one that taught us a lot about Jupiter and the Galilean moons when it was launched back in 1989. The antenna didn't deploy, the big one didn't deploy, it didn't work. So we had to use a really tiny one that was like, you might not understand, but it's like using dial up versus current Wi Fi and internet speeds. Just takes a really, really long time. It's like sending information very slowly. So we do our best to, to repair them and send them along the way. Kevin, it's really distressing to me that the two of us know what dial-up is and we have to sort of explain that, that could be something to kids who have no idea what we're talking about. Oh, well, getting very old. slow internet, very, <laughs> very slow internet. Um, I'm gonna go to Ms. Cum's class and the story in just a second, but I love this question from the math booth. So we got a high school math teacher in Nevada in Las Vegas. So okay. they want to ask, how often do you use math in your career, Kevin? Every single day. <laughs> we use math every single day. So I ended up going, uh, let's see, through like six math classes past Calculus 1. So it's Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, differential equations, linear algebra, computer, uh, com computational methods. And then there were a few others like linear regression, like all of the math behind Excel. I learned how to do that by hand. And we use math all the time to build computer simulations and computer code to help us design our spacecraft. And not only to help design the spacecraft, but we're taking all of this data, then we need a way to analyze the data. You know, it starts as ones and zeros, which is just binary code. And then we have to convert that into actual data that we can use. And then we use the math to study our data, to understand it, to see if what we're studying is exactly what we're looking for. And it's used all the time. The biggest thing I will say with the math is that you need to know enough to then build your computer simulation, and then the computer does all the hard work, but you have to put all the good quality stuff into the computer to get good quality stuff out of it. Fantastic, I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks so much to the school. Um, so let's go to Ms. Cum's class. Come on in guys and uh, take us away. How big does the speech back get? How big is it? How big is it? So, uh, is there, can you have life on Europa? Can you live on Europa and how yeah. big is the spacecraft? Yeah. Okay, cool. How big is the spacecraft? It's gigantic. So I'm I'm six foot four. If I'm standing next to the spacecraft, it's taller than me, right? And if I put my arms out, I'd have to put my arms out like 10 times to get all the way across it. So it's pretty big, it's big. And then can we live on Europa? No. So there's no atmosphere on Europa. This is We're in the atmosphere right now. We're breathing air. We think that the life on Europa is those tiny little microbes in the ocean. So it's down in the ocean. So maybe it is possible if we built like submarines to live in on Europa, that's something that we could do. But on the surface, there's too much radiation and it's too cold. We wouldn't last very long. Good question. It is. Sorry, it's just so funny watching you compared to other space people bring on because one of the questions we often get, and I hate to take it away if a kid's going to ask it, but it's like, would you go to space if you could? And I think you'd be like in the first, the first rocket into the submarine, into the European Ocean, so fast. But yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, awesome, man. All right, I'm going to go to Miss Hood's class. Joining us in Ackland, Pennsylvania. We're going to come to Norway Middle School and Miss Gualtieri's in a minute, but Miss Hood, take us away. Come on up. Hi, Kevin. Hello. I first want to thank you for giving the message of perseverance to our students who are learning virtually from home. I think that is a great message that they can take something from. Um, our question is, um, how often have your expertise that you used for Ninja Warrior and your expertise as a rocket scientist, how often have they like come together or overlapped for you? I like it. <laughs> I love this question, and it's something I normally try to like fit into every single presentation. But what I like to say is like the reason I like am an American or like am a rocket scientist is because I was an American Ninja Warrior. So the fitness side of me, like eating right, exercising, really helps my brain. Right, like 
it has been shown that immediately, well, during and immediately after exercise, your brain retains more information. You can learn more things and then hold on to it. So when school got tough and when work got tough, I would take a break, go for a run, go to the gym to lift some weights, do some jumping jacks, just go for a walk around to help reset my system. And then I would come back and I would be able to solve the problem. I would like, I like to say that if I'm working on code, I can sit and try and figure it out if I'm like at a standstill for like four hours, or I can take a half hour break to walk around, go for a run, come back, and I will finish that code in about 30 minutes. So it saves time, it resets your system, you're able to think more clearly, you have more energy and stamina to continue on and actually do rocket science, which is what we would be doing 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day. So it actually overlaps a lot. It's not like, how am I able to do Ninja Warrior and be a rocket scientist? Like Without Ninja Warrior, I wouldn't be able to do my rocket science. So like, the, the health and fitness aspect cross over a lot. Now let's throw it on the on the ninja side, right? Ninja is a puzzle. It's not like just running or lifting weights where you pick stuff up, put it down. I did that. I was a bodybuilder. Moved to the ninja because I have to figure it out with my brain. It's like what angles, this honestly goes through my head, would be best to put my foot at to hold at what is going to be the moment arm. So that's a that's a physics term right there. You know, moment arm is here. It's like pivoting around. The longer it is, the more torque and momentum can go. I'm like, okay, well, I want to keep my body tight. So actually, I go through the physics and math in my head when I'm looking at a new obstacle and the best way to do it. Crosses over a lot more than you think. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Uh, let's go to Norway Middle School, Mr. Fulton's class. If you guys want to come up to the broadcast, go for it, guys. Hello. Hi. So what Coding environment do you use for spacecraft design? What coding environment do I use for spacecraft design? My main one that I use is Python, if you've heard of that. And the the UI that I use is called Spider, S-P-Y-D-E-R, and that's how I implement my Python. This is kind of advanced. You kind of need to know a little bit about coding of what I'm talking about. But uh, Python is the main one I've used. MATLAB is used a lot. VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, that's the coding behind Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint. Uh, we use that a lot. We use a lot of Excel to build up simulations. So it would be Python, MATLAB, VBA, and also the two I will say is Jython, which is Java Python together. That's crazy. But that helps run MBSE. So it's Model-Based Systems Engineering where we implement the systems modeling language, SysML, to design our spacecrafts in a computer situation environment, where it's not just the, like, the physical model of the computer, but we're putting in requirements, so sentences of saying what the spacecraft has to do, and we can link those up to people. So I am an expert in model-based systems engineering as well. So yeah, I guess that would be, <laughs> that would be it. Mostly, mostly Python would be the, the number one but I've actually also had to work with something called Fortran. You may not have heard of it. It's a very old language, but we we build something at NASA and it works, so we're gonna use it again. So I've had to learn someone's code from 60 years ago to apply to my spacecraft today. Hmm. How cool is that? Awesome, all right, Miss Walteri's class, you're in, you're delayed, you're in. but you asked a question, go for it. Okay, uh, one of our question is, uh, how is time different in space is one question. And oh, and the other one is how much did it cost to build the clipper or the, the clipper? Okay, I'll go with uh, that one first. It's a little bit easier to answer. So how much does it cost it to build the clipper or lander or I'll even throw in the Mars rover? It's a couple billion dollars is what we're looking at. Somewhere between like, one to four billion normally is the range for those really big spacecrafts. Um, Europa Clipper, it's not completely done yet, but I believe the estimate is somewhere around two billion. Now, to throw a crazy number out there, we have the James Webb Space Telescope that's being built right now. That's looking around $10 billion right now. It's been delayed, there's a lot more money put into it. So it's a lot of money. And most of that money isn't actually the cost of the pieces. It's to actually pay the hundreds of people that are working together to build the spacecraft. 
That's the main part of it. So how is time different in space? Now I'm gonna try and keep this very high level so we can understand it. It's called time dilation. And depending on essentially how much gravity you're close to, you can experience time differently than other things. So if we find life somewhere else that has a different sort of gravity, it can experience time slower or faster than us. The astronauts on the International Space Station, that's about 200 miles up, about 400 kilometers, orbiting Earth every 90 minutes, are actually a little bit younger than their counterparts down on the surface of Earth because they have less gravity. It's interesting. The, the ends of their DNA, called telomeres, actually get a little bit longer in space due to the microgravity, the lack of gravity. Now, when they come back down to Earth, they shrink back down, but they do get a little bit younger in space. That was a great explanation for a very complicated topic. We can go into some cool, like, special relativity stuff going on, but great question, guys. Um, what I want interstellar to get a, a good explanation of time dilation. That's a good movie that'll explain the theory of it. Not only will it explain it, but when you're watching the movie, it's such an intense score that you will physically age longer. You'll age more than the two and a half hour runtime as well. Like five years of life go by when you're watching Interstellar. Um, Ms. Hamilton, uh, again, is joining us for the first time. I want to make sure she gets the last question from her classes. And then Kevin will wrap up by highlighting more ways that kids can share their queries with you because we have more than we could possibly answer. So Ms. Hamilton, come on back in and go for it. Oh, thank you for allowing us to have the last question. So we've got, what is the most important part of designing a spaceship? Uh, no pressure on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the most, oh, I'm going to go two of them. I'm going to go with like soft skills and hard skills. So the most important part about designing a spacecraft is teamwork, is being able to communicate with everybody else that is working together. Because we are not building a spacecraft alone. There are hundreds if not a thousand people involved in some of our spacecraft. So we need to be able to communicate effectively our concerns, our designs, our ideas, so that we all understand what's going on. That's the soft skills. The hard skills, the most import about, important part about designing a spacecraft is making sure that it works. And if it doesn't work, we build in redundancy or another way to do something. So we'll put two cameras in case one fails, we'll put in two computers. And we'll also put in redundancy in terms of computer coding. So we always leave a way so that we're able to change the spacecraft a little bit after it's left the surface of Earth, because you can't call a tow truck in outer space. We can just call it and tell it a few things. So we gotta make sure it works. Cause like I said, there are billions of dollars out there in outer space. So being able to communicate effectively with your team, making sure the spacecraft works. Fantastic. Great question to wrap us up. Uh, so thanks, Ms. Hamilton. Thanks to all our teachers. And so a bunch of things as we wrap up here. Number one, Kevin's website on the bottom of your screen in a bar. Uh, check it out. All sorts of really cool stuff. Yeah, we're there. It's somewhere over there. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. All sorts of great information about him, his books, his work, etc. You can check out his name uh, right under his picture there. So at Kevin J. DeBruin. Instagram, ask questions. He's one of the few speakers we have that will literally answer all of your questions. So bug him, harass him, hundreds by the end of the day. Um, Bring it up. To, yeah, <laughs> let's do it, guys. Uh, Europa, if you want to learn more about the mission, europa.nasa.gov, bottom of your screen. It's an amazing program for an amazing moon. Check it out, learn more. Uh, to NASA and beyond, Kevin's book, check that out. And then one thing that I really like, actually, first, a Place Called Space, some amazing videos Kevin's been producing over the last few months, some really, really cool stuff. Check it out, it'll keep the learning going. And then finally, something we didn't get a chance to touch on, in Kevin's talk, he showed this really cool travel poster of Europa that NASA produced. NASA allows people to download those. So, yep. it's a bit of a long, unwieldy URL. Go to that website, you can check out travel posters for Europa, for Titan, for other moons and planets in the solar system. Really cool campaign, really cool book. Um, print them off, put them in your classroom, and send us a picture of, of you doing that if you're keen. Kevin, is there any last message you'd like to share before we wrap up? It's been such a fun talk today. What are we yeah, going to end with? It's been amazing. I will uh, leave with with two little phrases that I live by my live my life by. One is never give up, and the other one is change the world.
Fantastic, guys. Well, I'm I'm inspired to change the world. I'm inspired to take some action. I hope you guys are all too. Uh, Kevin, as you know, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in every one of our teachers. So, Miss Dubrai, Miss Hamilton, Miss Cump, Miss Hood, Miss Walteri, join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to Kevin. You're all in. Go for it.